2010. Yeah, I'm a little bit late to this party. I'm a couple years behind. Please excuse my tardiness as we venture further and further back into the films of contemporary history. But that said, this is actually as far back as I planned to go. One of the films on this list was so formative that it got me into film completely. And even though 2010 was a dead, terrible, pathetic year for film, ugh, my expertise only ventures back so far. If we keep going back, when will it end? When will it stop? The top 10 of 1958, see? Number 10 goes to Double Indemnity. The new Billy Wilder flack, ever late. <laughs> the latest Nickelodeon. I can't commit to this bit. It's too funny. It's too funny a bit. I can't even remember 2010. Was it a year? How young was I? God knows how this is the year I got into film when so many of the releases were hot trash. But these were my formative years. You guys remember Cop Out? The Bruce Willis classic Cop Out? You know, with Bruce Willis. No, me either. This is a year devoid of culture or quality. But I did manage to find 10 diamonds in the rough. So without any further ado, number 10, Toy Story 3. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Pick up your troubles in the moon. You got a friend in me. Heads up, 2010 was the year of animation. All the animation companies ruled, from How to Train Your Dragon, Despicable Me, Tangled, Arietti, Megamind. For the first time, every studio was taking advantage of 3D animation, putting everybody on the same playing field. But this is 2010, so Pixar are still the reigning champs. I got a snake in my boot. I got a snake in my pants. What? That's not the line. Oh no. <laughs> is it fair to rank a movie completely on its ending? Because that's what I plan on doing. The Toy Story series has always been a masterclass on how to tug at the heartstrings. A perfect blend of nostalgic sentimentality and abandonment issues. Woo! Resulting in the third film being a surprise prison break film. As well as an existential eye-opener. Nobody talks nearly enough about how this film steals all its plot beats and ideas from the second film. But I think this plagiarism is okay. Number one, because the HD update is amazing. Real toys, real stories. And also, if you're gonna steal from a film, steal from Toy Story 2. <laughs> that film is the shit. It's pretty gutsy for Pixar to deliver a climax where all of our beloved cast of characters are burned down into plastic. This is a film where Woody the Disney Cowboy looks into the fires of hell and embraces death. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the movie! Oh no, children are crying. Ugh. Fuck them, let them cry. And then somehow, in the space of 10 minutes, they do a 180 and deliver one of the happiest, sweetest endings in film history. How? Pro tip! For extra tears, don't look at this scene from Andy's point of view. Look at it from the toys. Finally getting payoff. Thanks for their years of service. Gorgeous. It's childhood sentimentality handled with an adult level of retrospective nuance. Perfect closure is a rare thing in film. And you had to go and ruin it, huh? Number nine, Insidious. Tiptoe through the tulips of the garden. I am finally having the balls to marathon the Insidious movies, and the first one is genius. Fun, schlocky horror approached with a, just a bit of subtlety for once. Never does this film tell you to be scared. There's no jump scare sound effects, and the only scares there are are thoroughly earned. Oh man, honestly, watch this. No jumps, I promise. Did you see it? Oh, the scariest moment in this film, and James Wan didn't even bring attention to it. Insidious is terrifying because it turns your house into a horror maze. Like any good horror, it's the subtleties that stay with you. And even though it's familiar, oh my god, there's a human bit of curiosity that wants to know more about this world. But if this is me in this situation, oh, I kill myself so early on. 
I'm dead within the 20 minute mark. Number 8, Batman. Under the Red Hood. A straight to DVD release, this is probably my favourite piece of Batman media. You know what, fuck Warner Brothers trying to convince me that I don't love this character. Fuck Dawn of Justice, fuck Suicide Squad. If you want to see these characters done with justice, you go to the animated stuff. As someone who has not grown up with these characters, you can take it from me, there's no bias. Under the Red Hood is a genuinely engaging superhero movie in its own right. Now, I love the Jack Nicholson Joker, I think he's a class A act. But in this film, the voice actor of Jake the Dog and Bender does the Joker and it shouldn't work at all. DiMaggio's Joker presents him as some sort of deranged performance artist. He's an actor first, and it's so much fun to watch. The Red Hood is a dope villain, and Batman is at his best when he's being a paternal figure. Daddy Bats! A whole important side of the character that Hollywood are depriving us of. Batman fan or no, I think you'll get a lot out of this film. Next, Super! Super is the child of James Gunn, writer and director of so many films, and a man who could not get more of a verbal hand job on this channel if I tried. Shut up, crime! Please do not be fooled by the terrible poster, this is so much more than a kick-ass brand superhero parody. Super is the story of Dwight from The Office, who has, I mean, something wrong with him? And his idea of being a hero of the people is using his trusty wrench to beat up people who like Q jump. Very, very minor things. This isn't a well adjusted dude. It is mad that Disney gave uh, this guy, this guy, a Marvel movie. Because, hot damn, this film is cynical and almost mean spirited with the idea of a superhero. Super really succeeds where Kick-Ass did not, because it could really care less about parodying geek culture, and just makes a fun character piece instead. Super is a twisted movie. Add it to the list of fun, dumb, but morally deranged films that that weird kid in class, he should never see this. Number six, I'm still here. Joaquin Phoenix's fall from grace, from the Hollywood industry, was itself an act. This actor at one point was the laughing stock of the industry. Interviews, late night comedy, award shows even, of a man who has clearly fallen off the wagon. But little did Hollywood know, they were getting played. Joaquin Phoenix plays kind of himself in one of the biggest publicity stunts of all time. Meta, inverse, not quite sure where the lines are between real and fake. It's one of the biggest artistic media stunts ever, and this man playing himself jeopardises his career in the process. And throughout one film, sullies his own reputation, his good name, cocaine, <laughs> cocaine phoenix, nice. And starts his long awaited rap career. Think Borat but played completely straight-faced. This isn't just a caricature, this is a character of a real dude, and it's one of the most ambitious social experiments ever put to film. Vanity, self-success, and the vacuous hole of Hollywood. Yeah, this documentary goes places. Just don't be put off by the hordes and hordes of dick pics. This film is filled with penis. So much penis. Five. Shutter Island. Now, call me a bad film student, but I'm not a lover of the majority of Scorsese. I love Hugo, I think Wolf of Wall Street is irresponsible fun, but Shutter Island is undeniably a masterpiece. He's a great established filmmaker, but he just doesn't kind of make my sort of film. Shutter Island is a thriller that has so much fun being a thriller. Because although you could take a premise like this very seriously, Scorsese recognises it is pulpy, psychological fluff. Shutter Island's unravelling is layered and brilliant, but you know that a lesser director would have done it so dryly. This has all the makings of a dry film. You know, Scorsese got the Oscar with Departed, and now he's just having some 50s, 
detective fun with some A-class actors. And despite the grey colour palette and the terrifying setting, this film is and looks beautiful. And this film is long. A long, winding maze of a movie. A labyrinth that actually keeps your attention till the end. I have to credit it for that. My attention span is like 19 minutes max, because I was brought up on Scooby-Doo. The ending twist is 100% B-movie, but when pulled off by a director and actors like this, I love it. If I'd made this video like a year ago, this is where Tangled would sit on the list. I love Tangled. Disney reinvigorated themselves in 2010 by doing what they do best. Curses, witches and princesses. Princesses with dreams! It did a lot of the stuff first that later Frozen would take credit for. But the inner cinephile tells me, no, Sam, put down the animation for once in your life. The real number four spot goes to a film called Le Quattro Volte, or The Four Turns. An Italian piece of slow cinema. Oh, fucking hell, Sam. Why can't you just talk about Tangled? This quasi-religious, archaic story horrified me. There's no dialogue, shots go on for such a long duration it feels like photography. There are human protagonists, but there are just as much tree protagonists and baby lamb protagonists. My favourite one is the dog, but that's not a surprise. This film is beautiful, basically equating the human experience as just one quarter of sentient life. It's a poetic, vague film where we don't really even know what time period we're in. This film is about changes, reincarnation. Uh, a man goes from the animal realm, to the plant realm, to the mineral realm, as what Pythagoras claimed were the four stages of life. And although that sounds like a lovely thought, the reality is actually quite disturbing. The world is harsh, you will probably die alone, but death is equal to life. I sound super pretentious right now, but trust me, this isn't a boring art film. It's genuinely self-reflective. I've also watched this very, very high. Don't do that. Don't, don't watch it high. <laughs> it's a strange one to recommend, but please just seek this one out and see what I mean. You might even love it. And for the record, I would make a dope live-action Flynn Rider. Number three. Oh, this is a weird one. The Karate Kid with Jackie Chan and Jaden Smith. Nobody expected this to be here. Nobody wants this to be here. Who remembers the Jaden Smith Karate Kid? I do. First thing you gotta know about the Karate Kid is that there is no karate in this film. This is very clearly Kung Fu. Just change the name. Clearly a decision from upstairs trying to cash in on a previous nostalgia film from the 80s, but this film actually bears a little resemblance to it. Exploring a lot of new interesting ground and correcting a lot of the weird racial stuff in the old one. Yeah, I see you. And you know what? Thank God, because this is one of the few exceptions where a reboot is justified. Different themes, you've got a new take. Go wild! And I know we reboot everything from the 80s, but this stands up as a film in its own right. And for the audience, it's oddly profound. And what does it add to the tired table of martial art cliches? Well, cultural ostracization. In a culture trained in discipline and tradition, Mr. Han doesn't teach him an ultra spinning kick. He teaches him decency. The spiritual true nature of not Kung Fu, but people. And over the duration of these gorgeous training set pieces, he never actually teaches him much in the way of stances. I also think it's the best master and student relationship ever put to film. These two help each other out as people. One, showing him how to vent his frustration and attitude into understanding. And Jane Smith with this gorgeous scene. Yeah, this film goes deeper than it needs to go. That beats, uh, oh, go and do some household chores any day. And if you think that impression was racist, <laughs> Go and watch the original Karate Kid, bitch. And actually, in the rewatch, Mr. Han conditions Dre to find real love for the country he now has to call home. 
I don't think China is ever villainized in this film, I'm not really the expert to say, but the entire end message is just respect. Dre doesn't really learn any major technique to win the tournament, but that's the point. Before he fell off the deep end, Jaden Smith was a charismatic little kid. And this entire film, as a martial art film, as a movie in general, is joy. Number two. Pawn your pawn, your little fishy in the sea. She's a little girl with a round tummy. It's the musical, it's the musical episode. Ponyo is the happiest movie created by man. It is unbridled, childish, destructive joy. A uh, petition to dub this film with Eren as Ponyo and me as Liam Neeson. Ponyo of Sasuke! Ponyo wants him! Ponyo, listen to your father. The pastel backgrounds, the primary colour scheme, the happiness and excitement after a terrible event. This is the ultimate feel-good movie, and it's one that only Hayao Miyazaki could make. Ponyo wants to be where the people are. She wants to see them. See them dancing. Walking around on those... what you call them? Feet. And she also has a hunger for flesh! But instead of going the teenage angst princess route, Ghibli does something much more magical. Here is a young, naive, powerful, ocean deity that will accidentally flood the world until she finds her best friend. Ponyo wants dick. Well, hey, she's like four. <laughs> Weirdly, I find that this film is madly underrated, even alongside its other counterparts in the Ghibli catalogue. It's as if a film can be too bright and colourful, like, get out of your ass, this is a kid's film that can be enjoyed by any human. It has all the artistic merit of even his best works. And although it's not the most complex take on his environmentalist themes, it indoctrinates kids with a message to preserve the world around them. And that's gorgeous. Ponyo is one of the best Ghibli films ever made. Actually, scratch that, it's one of the best animated films ever made. Okay, scratch that, it's one of the best films ever made. Yeah, put it up there. If this was in any other year, any other list, this would be my number one. But this wasn't any normal year. The best film of 2010 was Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. The tentpole movie, the sole reason I'm studying film and I've devoted a bad amount of time to cinema. The quick, frenetic pace, my nerdy wet dream aesthetics put to screen. The clever foreshadowing of the amazing sense of hu weirdo humour. It is no surprise that this film landed with me as hard as it did. It was the film that made me realise that the cinema wasn't just something you did every other month. No, it was a goal. It was a pedestal. It was a gateway drug. This film has gained a cult following in the years to follow, and it did terrible at the box office. But. Mostly, I appreciate it, because it showed me what I thought films weren't capable of. And then, it turns out, this was made by a man called Edgar Wright, and this isn't even his best film. It's mind-blowing. Whenever I watch this film, I feel that energy, I feel that fresh enthusiasm again. As far as adaptations go, this isn't the original comic. It's better. A movie better than the book, you might say providing visual gags, streaming out all the unnecessary subplots, and also improving on the weaker parts of the Scott Pilgrim book series. This film is a miracle. Filled with details in every single frame, you can watch this 50 times and always find something new. Edgar Wright is probably the most exciting filmmaker alive today. Michael Cera works, even though he's not the book, but he still works. And uh, yeah. This film deserved the world. And those were the top 10 films of 2010. No more!